one thing that a lot of people haven't experienced, unfortunately, is how to argue. Now, personally, I enjoy a fantastic argument when people are going at each other, borderline frothing at the mouth. But the kind of argument I'm talking about here is different. I'm not talking about regular fights such as who should be taking out the trash on Tuesdays or who was the one that left the lights on in the hallway. The kinds of arguments I'm talking about are very real arguments concerning very real issues that affect many of us. Social, political, and economic issues of very major consequence. Now, these are proper arguments where people are annihilating each other. Opponents continuously bludgeon each other with fact after fact, pointing out logical fallacies and ad hominems and meticulously crafting logical statements that coalesce into a brilliant discussion. And the reason that I claim that many people have not had the pleasure of experiencing this type of proper argument is because of the way that people are conditioned to approach arguing in the first place. Almost all of the time, the goal in arguing is improving yourself right. Now, this is obviously correct, because what would the point of arguing be in the first place if you weren't trying to prove yourself correct? But unfortunately, the way that people go about arguing makes these arguments very much pointless in the first place. In an opinion piece written by one Peter Bregman in the Harvard Business Review, claimed that arguing is something that is very pointless in the first place because it's a very guaranteed losing move. Now, Peter Bregman stated that when people argue with each other, they only really pretend to be listening to what the other person is saying and what the other person's arguing. But what the person's really doing is that they're only thinking about the very petty weaknesses in the argument to try and disprove their entire point. Or in a lot of occasions, the argument can become personal. And now the problem is no longer the other person's argument, but it's the person themselves that is the problem, as well as everybody who would be agreeing with that person's stance. However, I don't think that Peter has been introduced to the world of schools debating and exactly what that world can offer to people. So allow me to explain. I've been a schools debater for almost five years. And often what I get asked by people about debating is what is debating like and whether they should be going into it or giving it a shot. One of the more common questions that I'm asked to go something like this. Debating is pretty much shouting at each other until you win, right? One of the best comments that I've received a couple years ago is debating is just AP arguing, which I find very amusing. Now, I find these viewpoints to be very similar to the way that people can look at things like war and conflict. You should think when things like war is mentioned is a bloody battlefield, evisceration, and people being left a battle scar once they leave the front lines. Now, that is indeed a very real part of war, but understand that it doesn't make up the whole equation. War is also about very sophisticated and complicated maneuvering and strategy that can go on behind closed doors. Countries can lose to wars because they can be outmaneuvered and outstrategized, and not necessarily because they are beaten to death in an obviously violent way. And I find that to be the very same thing with debating and arguing and those concepts. Some people think that it's all about screaming at each other, but actually it's a much more sophisticated kind of battle. See, the people who view debating as a place where you merely howl and screech at each other until the judge says you win, doesn't do justice to the wonderful world that debating can be. It doesn't do justice to the world that debating is. Now, I don't blame these people. I don't blame them for having this stance because the only arguing that they have been exposed to consists of either shrieking or ad hominems or interruptions or fighting and sometimes even more shrieking, right? Schools debating, however, puts you in an environment where all of that is virtually removed. Now I say virtually because people are obviously imperfect and sometimes a bit of shade can be thrown across the room, across the team, 
but it's still an environment that is conducive to very proper discussion. It's an environment that is conducive to discussion that is at least a lot more proper than regular argument. Now, as with any official school extramural activity, a formal structure is needed. Schools debating does have a structure that, although flexible and moldable and changeable, needs to be followed very much precisely. So for clarity, let me outline quickly the structure. Now, there are two teams of three individual speakers on each side in a debating room. One team will propose the argument or support it, and the other team is going to oppose that argument. Now the speakers are given the motion or the argument to be debated, and they are then given an hour to prepare their case, where each individual speech takes up about six to seven minutes. Now this differs depending on the debating style used. For example, in the British Parliamentary Schools debating style, teams are given only 15 minutes to prepare their case. However, like regular schools debating style, their speeches also have to last around six to seven minutes. You're not allowed to interrupt a speaker whilst they are speaking. However, during the speech, you are allowed to raise your hand if you're on the opposing side, and you can stand up and offer a point of interest, which is a 15 second attack on the current speaker's case, which that speaker has to then immediately counter or oppose. Additionally, the use of Google or any other electronic devices is strictly prohibited and this is done in order to discourage cheating or unfairness, right? So what this means specifically is that if you want to introduce a fact or a statistic, it can't come from the internet, but it must come from your own general knowledge. Now understand, however, that although you need to have general knowledge, you don't actually have to be super knowledgeable about the entire world and everything that's going on in it, just to be able to reap the rewards that debating can offer you. Some of the debates that we have are actually quite in depth and a robust case is going to require a hell of a lot more than some context or some knowledge in order to win. So let me offer up an example to explain how this is so. Back in 2017, uh, my team was debating on a peculiar topic and it was worded as such. Assuming that the technology to do so existed, should we allow people to be able to buy and sell years of their natural life? A natural life being the number of years you would be alive in the event that you aren't hit by disease or disaster. Understand that a debate like this, it doesn't actually require any general knowledge at all because you're not looking at something that has happened or something that is currently happening in our world, but you're rather looking at something that's very hypothetical, you're looking at a scenario that could occur in the future something that could happen due to some random event or due to developments that are currently taking place in the real world, due to events that are unfolding. Now debates like this are quite interesting because they offer up the opportunity for you to be very creative and to be able to explore the limits of logical reasoning. Let me offer up another example here to tell you what I mean. One of the arguments that our team ran in that specific debate as the opposing side, was that we should be able to limit the sale of natural years of your life because selling those years would ensure that those in poverty had ultimately less years to be able to live. They would be very likely to sell some or even most of the years they have left out of desperation. Now, that isn't exactly how we worded that argument. We obviously had a lot more to say. It was a lot more nuanced than that. But for the purpose of, of time, we'll just keep it simplistic. Now, in response to that argument, the proposing side countered by stating that people in poverty are in a situation where they're already facing very low living standards and that being able to provide them the opportunity to sell years from their natural life makes no difference at all because these low standards of living are likely to interrupt their natural lifespan either way due to sickness or starvation and that we'd at least be giving these people some avenue of income to make sure that the rest of their family can live on. However unfavorable the circumstances for that income to come around may be. Now, it was a very interesting debate and I genuinely cannot remember who won that debate. But what this debate and this argument shows is that you don't need a lot of knowledge to be able to reap the rewards that debating can give you. 
you're still able to use your creativity and you're still able to use your logical reasoning to be able to make those connections between your initial points in order to reach a conclusion. So what I want you to take note is that one of the fundamental benefits of being a schools debater or being a debater in general is that you're able to become a lot more logical and you're able to become a lot more creative because now you can start making new connections between these scenarios and you can start making connections between those scenarios and the worlds that they take place in. Understand, however, that whilst knowledge isn't a prerequisite for being a debater, it certainly helps in being able to argue some very specific topics, very nuanced topics. These are topics that make direct or indirect reference to the world that we inhabit or the people in it. Uh, these topics stem usually from a variety of political, social, and economic issues. Uh, we talk about global politics quite often. An example of an argument that we've been given before is, should film stars, music stars, and other public figures be prohibited from participating in political campaigns? We also often debate social movements themselves. Should the feminist movement voice their support for the social contributions of male feminists? We also often get arguments that talk about the climate crisis itself and how we should progress through that crisis. Should we divert most of our scientific funding away from climate reversal research and instead put it to trying to make life off of Earth habitable? Last but certainly not least, we also have arguments that pertain to the economic status of our world. Should the United States use economic warfare against China to force compliance with the rules of the global neoliberal economic world order? These debates sound very complicated and wordy, and that's because they actually are. They're difficult for a number of reasons, or they can be difficult for a number of reasons. Firstly, you might not always know what you are talking about. You might not always know how to go about approaching a debate or an argument. What if you don't know any music stars who take part in political campaigns? Or, for example, what if you don't know anything about what the global neoliberal economic order is? Secondly, the people who are arguing against you also might not know what they themselves are talking about. Now, this can happen, and it usually results in a very messy and disorganized debate, which can end up being very hard for you to follow or to even engage with. Now, these kinds of debates I call as close to a regular argument as debating can become. Now, thirdly, this is the final reason, is that the team that you're arguing against knows a lot about the topic at hand, in which case they are going to be able to counter all of your arguments that you present, and they're going to stand up to offer points of interest at almost every single minute of your speech, and they're going to attack every single one of your points. Now, this is one of the best challenges that debating can offer for you. Now, sure, it's great to have a lot of knowledge at your disposal to be able to use in a debate or to be able to use other people, but it's the fact that you need to implement this knowledge into a case that is the most cha challenging part. You'll have to dig deep into your mind and navigate the complexities of whatever social or political or economic issue that you're currently grappling with. And you'll have to create those arguments you'll have to create those responses. Now, in the case that the opposing team gives a point of interest against you, for example, you're put on the spot and you're immediately forced to defend your point in light of the attack that has been made by that opposing team. Furthermore, your teammates are also going to be forced to defend your case. Now, that will only happen in the event that the opposing team actually manages to attack it properly. But there are also benefits for the other people who are in the room with you and for the other people who are in your debating room. However, this last challenge I wish to say, because this is a challenge that debating offers that can rival everything else that I've mentioned so far. For new debaters, hearing this challenge for the first time usually sends a chill up their spine. Now the challenge is as follows. You are not allowed to pick which side you are going to argue for. This is immensely difficult for some people, especially new debaters, or especially if people strongly believe in something. Debaters who personally believe, for example, that universal healthcare is beneficial, there's the chance that they are put in, put in a debating room 
where they are forced to oppose universal health care. People can have very strong convictions for American pop culture, but those people could also be placed into a debate where they have to argue why the government's taking measures to limit the spread of American pop culture is a good thing. These are debates that are very challenging. And the most challenging part about this, and arguably the most beneficial aspect about debating, is that debating can force you to think outside of your personal convictions. It forces you to think outside of what you personally believe in, sometimes forcing you to debate directly against what you personally believe. Debating allows you to develop the ability to think very critically on an issue instead of remaining in your confined chamber, instead of remaining in the small bubble. Debating gives you the opportunity to step outside of your comfort zone and see the other side to the discussion a side that may have always remained out of your field of view. This challenge and this benefit is an immensely powerful tool, which has so many applications. For example, in the world of academics, critical thinking is very important because you must be able to construct sound arguments that have been critically evaluated on both sides sometimes. Debating is able to teach you that and it's able to give you that skill. The level of analysis debating forces you to use can be put to further use in the business world as well. Because in the business world, you need to be able to apply reasoning to be able to discern the outcomes and responses for certain corporate decisions or situations. Being able to think critically isn't simply some sort of glowing generality. It's a very potent skill to be able to have in your personal arsenal. So understand that from what I've said, Schools debating is obviously a very powerful self-development tool. Now, I've interacted with many people in the debating sphere, and a few of them have become very close friends of mine, people who I still talk to to this day. Outside of all of those friendships and all of the discussions that we have had together, we've all grown and matured quite a lot in our own ways in the very seemingly short time span that we've spent in the debating circuit. Debating is something that you too can make a use of. It's something that you can use to develop your critical thinking skills, to break free from the fetters of one-sided argumentation, to expand your creativity further, to be able to develop your logical reasoning. The best way we can be able to talk to each other about the issues that affect all of us is if we leave behind our deeply rooted personal convictions. The only way we can have proper arguments is if we leave behind our pettiness and our emotions at the door, if we let ourselves in, and if we embrace the wonders of logical and creative thinking.